Good morning. Welcome to our Sunday service. This week we're continuing in our series in the life of Elijah. You remember last week we left Elijah on the mountain of God and there he came face to face with God and God spoke to him in a still small voice. Well today we're moving on to the next part where Elijah is told what to do next. And one of his tasks was to appoint a prophet in his stead, Elisha. And we're going to find out how Elisha exchanged being in control of his life as a farmer to becoming a servant of Elijah. Of course, as we think of one who was great, who became a servant, we need to think about the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're reminded of that in our opening song this morning. Uh, From heaven you came helpless babe the servant king so before we do anything else let's just share that lovely song together now 
servant king. Shall we speak to God in prayer? Father, we thank you for reminding us this morning already of that one who took upon himself the form of a servant, who became obedient and willingly gave up his life. And Father, we think of the words that we've just shared together. Come see his hands and his feet, the scars that speak of sacrifice, hands that flung stars into space to cruel nails surrendered. And Father, we thank you for that one who became the servant king, the one who suffered and died for us. Lord, help us as we think about this to respond with servant hearts to the challenge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, this morning as we share something of the life of Elijah, help us to gain from it something that we can put into practice ourselves and something that we can make part of our lives. We thank you, Lord, for this time together. We pray that you would bless us as we share these thoughts together and just open our hearts and our minds to know what you would have to say to us. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity of sharing these wonderful truths from the Bible. And we pray that your Holy Spirit will just use them to guide us and bless us in our lives for you. So, Father, be with us now as we ask these things and commit ourselves to your loving care in jesus name amen now we're going to continue our thoughts of uh, giving our lives and service with the song i will offer up my life in spirit and truth and uh, as we share this let's just pray that god will speak to our hearts as we prepare to listen to his word In 
Last week when we finished our, our message, we left Elijah in a state where he had been in a position of total collapse. He was physically, mentally, spiritually washed up and broken and there he meets with God at Mount Sinai or Mount Horeb as it's called in 1 Kings. And there God appears to him, not in the, the earthquake, the wind or the fire, but in a still small voice. And we take up the reading from that point. We're reading now from 1 Kings 19, starting at verse 15. We read these words. The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came, and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu son of Nimshi king over Israel. And anoint Elisha son of Shaphat, from Abel Mahola to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escaped the sword of Hazael, and Elisha will put to death any who escaped the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve seven thousand in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and whose mouths have not yet kissed him. As we look at this command of God to Elijah, we see there are three things which are, are identified. There are three people who God is appointing. Hazael, Jehu, Elisha. Now just for a moment to look at the first two. Uh, it's interesting that Elijah didn't actually anoint either Hazael or Jehu. That was done later by Elisha. It doesn't happen until 2 Kings 8 and 2 Kings 9. But we're just going to look very briefly at these two men and then we'll return to Elisha. Hazael was to be anointed king over Aram. At that time there was another king, Ben-Hadad. And it's not till we get to 2 Kings chapter 8 that we find Elisha coming face to face with Hazael. Now it's worth noting that Hazael and Jehu, neither of them were of the royal line. Hazael was a, a servant of Ben-Hadad and he was actually sent to Elisha with a message. Ben-Hadad had been taken ill and he heard that Elisha had travelled to his country and so he sends Hazael to him with the question, am I going to get well? And as Hazael meets with Elisha, Elisha tells him, Tell your master, yes, you will recover, though actually he will die. And Hazael is given the full picture. And as these two men are there face to face, Elijah fixes him with a stare, so that we read Hazael became embarrassed. He was troubled. And then Elisha begins to weep. And as Hazael asks him, what, why is he weeping? He says, because I know what you are going to do to the people of Israel. And he describes for him the, the terrible atrocities that he is going to commit. And he finishes by saying, you will be the king of Aram. Now, he's not actually anointed, but he is appointed by God to be the new king. And on the strength of that, he goes back gives the message to Ben-Hadad that he will recover, but then later he goes in and murders the king and he becomes king in his stead. But in many ways this was a new beginning. It was the end of a dynasty and the beginning of a new dynasty. The same thing happened with Jehu in the following chapter. Jehu there it meets up with Elisha and Elisha anoints him. Now, Jehu was the commander of the army. He wasn't a prince, but uh, he was appointed to deal 
with the house of Ahab. You remember that Elijah had said previously that all the house of Ahab were to die. There would be no survivors. And that was, was Jehu's job. As Elijah anoints him, uh, Jehu begins a terrible purge of the house of Ahab and all connected with him. And he becomes the new king. And both of these men, Hazael and Jehu, were in many ways a new beginning. It was a change from the old. The old was corrupt and God was putting it one side and setting up new kings. Unfortunately, of course, neither of these new mo uh, monarchies were much better than what went before. Oh, it's true that Jehu did begin a purge of the idolatry that came from Baal worship. But he still clung to the golden calves that Jeroboam, son of Nebat, had set up. He still clung to idolatry. So although there was an improvement, it wasn't much of a success. But let's come back to Eli Elisha. Uh, we, we read as we take up the reading again in 1 Kings 19, verse 19. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was ploughing with twelve yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the twelfth pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him, and this would have been an act of appointment. He was telling Elisha, you are going to become my disciple, I am going to mentor you, and you are going to become prophet in my stead. Verse 20, Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. And some translations put in there that Elijah said to him, Go back for what have I done to you? Or in other words, remember what I have done to you and act upon it. So Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the ploughing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. Now, let's just pause there for a moment and ask the question, why Elisha? After all, Elisha wasn't one of the prophets. There were other prophets around. We read of an unnamed prophet in the next chapter. We read of Micaiah, son of Imla, in a later chapter, in one in two kings sorry one kings so why was elisha chosen why not one of the seven thousand that god spoke about and of course when we choose somebody for a job we look at their qualifications we look at their abilities but more than anything else we look for experience and an employer will always look for somebody who has experience in that field. Elisha had none. He had never been a prophet. And yet God is placing his hand upon Elisha as the one who would succeed Elijah, who is the major spokesperson for God in these chapters. Why Elisha? We don't know. But he was a man that God had his hand upon. And he was the one who was going to succeed Elijah. Elijah didn't choose his apprentice. God did. And again, like Hazael, like Jehu, it was a new beginning. It was a, a new pathway that was going to be trod. And he was going to become the prophet. But what was the challenge? If we look at Elisha, his was quite a comfortable existence, if we read between the lines. We read in the passage that we've just shared that Elijah, Elisha was ploughing with twelve yoke of oxen. He wasn't actually using the twelve. They were being used by servants. But he was driving the twelfth pair. So here was a family that had twelve yoke of oxen. It was fairly well off. Elisha wasn't living on a hand-to-mouth experience. He wasn't a peasant farmer. He would have been fairly well off and fairly comfortable. He would have been in charge of it all. But now along comes Elijah and says, leave this. 
become my servant. And he's moving from a place of authority and privilege to a place of servanthood and in a sense a, a life of hardship and threat because the prophets of God were still under threat. Ahab and Jezebel were still persecuting the, the prophets of God. So it, it was quite a challenging call to leave what was comfortable and to move into an area where his life would be in danger. And what was his response? Well, we read his response. He sacrificed the oxen and to, to kill two fine animals, two uh, yoke oxen, would have been quite a sacrifice. They would have been worth something. He burned the plough and he gave the food to the people. What was he doing? He was ridding himself of the past. There was no going back. His was a path that he was going to be committed to. I suppose we could use the words of that lovely old song, I have decided no turning back. You know the song, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. We know the song, we sing it so easily, but um, do we know the story behind it? Let's just listen to the song first and then we'll come back to what the song is all about. I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. decided to follow Jesus no turning back it's a hymn we well know it originates from India it was first written in Tamil as we just heard in the song that was sung and the lyrics are based on the last words of a man from the Garo tribe in Assam let's just think of the story for a moment about 150 years ago, a great revival started in Wales, culminating in the great 1904 revival that we're all aware of. As a result of this, many missionaries left the UK and came to North East India to spread the gospel. The region of Assam was comprised of hundreds of tribes who were primitive and aggressive headhunters. And it was into this hostile and aggressive community that a group of missionaries came and started preaching the mes message of the Lord Jesus Christ. Naturally, they were not welcomed. But one missionary in particular succeeded in converting a man and his wife and two children. And this man's faith proved to be contagious and many of his co-villagers began to accept the Lord Jesus Christ. The village chief 
was not happy about this and angrily he summoned all the villagers and called the family who had first con converted to renounce their faith in public or face the consequences. Moved by the Holy Spirit, the man said, I have decided to follow Jesus. The chief was enraged and ordered his archers to shoot the two children, the two boys. As both boys lay on the ground dying, the chief asked again, Will you deny your faith? You have lost both your children. Will you lose your wife as well? But the man replied, Though no one joins me, still I will follow. The chief was beside himself with fury and ordered his wife to be executed. And moments later she was lying on the ground next to her children, dead. He asked the man for the last time, I will give you one more chance. Deny your faith. Or face the consequences. In the face of death the man said the memorable lines, the cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back. He was shot dead like the rest of his family. But with their deaths something amazing took place. The chief suddenly looked at them again and was moved by the faith of this man and his family. He asked himself, why should this man and all his family die for a man who lived in a faraway land 2,000 years ago? There must be some remarkable power behind the family's faith. I want to taste that faith. And spontaneously, the chief declared, I too belong to Jesus Christ. And when his people heard this from the mouth of their own chief, the whole village accepted Christ as their Lord and Saviour. The song we have just listened to is based on the last words of Nok Seng, a man from the Garo tribe of Assam, and it is today the song of the Garo people. Nok Seng was not the only one who paid with his life for his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. There have been many others like him. Back in the days of the early church, there were many who gave their lives rather than renounce the Lord Jesus Christ. There have been down through the centuries. There still are today in many parts of the world. You know, today in the UK, we have life very easy. Sometimes we are almost complacent about our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. To some, they will enter on the, uh, the census form that they are Christian. But it's almost like making a choice of a favourite brand on the supermarket shelves. I'll just tick that box. I'm a Christian. What does it really mean? To be a Christian? What does it really mean to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, in the case of Elisha, when he became a prophet of God, it meant he was leaving the past behind him and there was no turning back. It reminds me a bit of Peter. You remember on the shores of Galilee, the Lord Jesus said to him, Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And we read that Peter, Andrew, James, John, they left their nets, they left their boats and they became followers of Jesus and they remained so for three and a half years. But the boats were always there, the nets were always there. When we come to John 21, we find Peter back in Galilee and he goes back to his boats. He says there to the seven I'm going fishing and he goes back to his boats and his nets for one last time until again he meets the risen Lord on the beach and there Jesus as he speaks with Peter he challenges him again follow me the same command and this time Peter leaves his nets 
and never goes back to them. That's what it means to follow with no turning back. Some people have had to give up jobs, livelihood, friends, family, even their lives because they follow Christ. We may not necessarily be called to give up any of those things. But there must be a willingness to surrender to the Lord Jesus. Anything we have and are that he might have first place. Can I ask you, as I ask myself, what is our plough? Elijah, Elisha burnt his plough. No turning back. What is our plough? What is it that's holding us back? From becoming a true follower of Jesus. What does it mean to be a true follower of Jesus? It's not just ticking a box on a censor sheet. It's not just saying, yes, I'm a Christian. It's something far deeper than that. First of all, it involves repentance, and that's what burning the plough signifies. It means laying aside the things that are getting in the way. And the Lord Jesus Christ calls us, first of all, to confess that we have failed, that we are sinners, that we need a saviour, that we need somebody to pay our penalty. And then having done that and having received him into our hearts, to become disciples, to learn from him, to be taught by him, to follow him. Or in many ways, we will probably carry on our lives just as we did before but with a new perspective with a new focus because now it's all for him and for his glory and for his purposes you see there are two sides to this coin on the one side we have the plough and Elisha burnt that but then as we burn our plough the Lord Jesus gives us the yoke, and the yoke was that which was attached to the plough. But now it's, it's the yoke of learning from him and walking with him and working with him. He could say, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly of heart, and you shall find rest to your souls. Actually, I love it the way that the message puts these verses. If you never come across the message, the message is a paraphrase of the Bible. It's not a translation. In many places, it's not always accurate because it uses a lot of idiomatic phrases, a lot of them American. But sometimes it captures the essence of what it means. And I think Eugene Patterson, who put the message together, has really captured it here in Matthew 11. It says this, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you learn how to live freely and lightly. You see, Elijah called Elisha. And from that point, Elisha began his mentoring, learning from Elijah. Until finally he became a prophet in his own right. The Lord Jesus calls us from who we are, whatever our lives are, whatever we're like inside or outside, to be his disciples. Firstly, to trust him and receive him as saviour. Secondly, to make him Lord and master in everything that we do. And then to learn, to become more like him every day. That's what burning the plough means. It means we're saying, me, I'm done. From here on, it's Jesus. And I want him to have first place in my life, to have all the glory. I wonder, are you there? Have you come to that place 
where the plough is burnt and you take the yoke of the Lord Jesus and follow him. I do pray that you may know the Lord Jesus in this way for his glory. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you call us, just as we are, to become your people, to trust you, to follow you, and then to learn from you. Help us, Lord, as we look at the life of these prophets of old, to take whatever is getting in the way and just be willing to lay it aside for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ and to be willing to follow him and to enjoy that life that he gives in all its fullness. Thank you, Lord, for what we've shared this morning. Bless us now, we pray, as we ask these things in his worthy name. Amen.
thank you for joining us this morning. It's been lovely to share with you these things. And I do pray that God will bless you as you've listened to this challenging passage from the Word of God. Next week we move on to the final part of our series where Elijah is caught up to heaven in a whirlwind. And the title for next week is The Goal is a Heavenly One. Of course, that is our goal, that one day we will be like the Lord Jesus Christ because we will be with him. Until then, pray that God will bless you for the week ahead and that you might know his presence and his guidance. Hope to see you again next week. Bye for now.